Welcome to another edition of the In Search SEO Podcast, where we paint the town red with search marketing insights. This week, we talk being discoverable with the CEO of Directive Consulting, Garrett Merguth, as in how to be discoverable by gobbling up as much market share as possible, taking advantage of review sites for discoverability, and where search fits into the discoverability picture. Plus, we take a look at the impact of the holiday season on the presence of PLAs on the SERP. I am your host, Morty Oberstein. I am joined by the effulgent, the chipper, Sapir Carabaro. Hello. Hello. <laughs> What's with that? Like, it went from hello, Morty, just like hello. What is that? <laughs> what? I'm greeting you. It's lackluster. No, it's not. Yeah, it's like hello. It's a normal, a normal, you know. Greeting. There's nothing normal about this podcast. Clearly. <laughs> Talk. I think you're, you know, talking about yourself. Evidently. Normal, right. Yes. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to imply that you weren't normal. You're very normal. Thank you for I being am. the normal person around here. <laughs> you Boring, are. but normal. Aha! You wish. I wish I what? That you weren't boring I or that you are normal? <laughs> this is getting out of control. Okay. Let's move on. Let's move on. Do not forget, we put out a new episode of the In Search SEO podcast each and every Tuesday. You can find it on the Rank Ranger blog. You can find it on Stitcher. You can find it on Spotify. You can find it on SoundCloud. And, of course, you may and you should subscribe on iTunes. Also, do not forget, or you can't forget, I didn't tell you, but... Uh, Do not forget after I tell you that we have added above the fold data to our SERP feature tracking tool. Now you can see the average number of results Google shows above the fold on the SERP for multiple screen sizes. Look for it under the resources tab on the Rank Ranger homepage. By the way, just a quick bit of data. Um, for when the screen size is 768 pixels, there are just 1.3 results on average that appear above the fold. And... Uh, for a screen size of 1,080 pixels, that number jumps up to just under three results above the fold. Interesting, important data, perhaps scary data. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, great show for you all today. Garrett Merguth comes by to chat about getting your brand more discoverable than ever. But first, I had a request, and no, it wasn't from Sapir to shut up. I preempted uh-huh. your little joke there. Oh, I had a real that's... request. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Some really good folks, some really good SEO folks out of South Africa, David Jenkins and Chris Avery of the Mickey Lou SEO Agency, asked if I could pull some data on PLAs during the holiday season for South Africa and other markets in general. So I did. Which means for the second week in a row, we are going data. So pretty simple stuff, unlike last week, which was a little bit complicated, I guess. Uh- so did you prepare another tiny, tiny study for us? You're making me feel insecure about my study size. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a terrible joke. Okay, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a cute name. I just, I love it. Tiny, tiny study. Tiny, t- you, yeah. yeah. Put me down again. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, no, no. I don't have okay. another tiny, tiny study for oh. us. Um, all I did, yes. I know it's a shame. I know. Uh, you were so hoping you could pick on me again. Yes, I, I was. Know. And you'll, it's okay. You'll find something else to pick on before. Yes, thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so this time all I did was I took a look at the PLA levels as of November 1st and then again as of November 30th, and I calculated the increase or decreases. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. You do know the holidays don't end on November 30th, right? No, I'm a total moron. I didn't know that. You are a total moron. <laughs> See, I knew you'd find a way to get it in there. No. <laughs> and it's was, it was with great American pride and great American ego that I say mm-hmm. November 30th because of thanks freaking giving. Okay. Because that's when Black Friday starts. So the world can thank us for Black Friday. <laughs> By the way, did you know when I was um, – that was a kid. When I first got married, so like, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago. There should be like 13 years ago. I should know that. <laughs> it really should. It's coming up. My anniversary is coming up also. Uh-huh. Yeah, 13 years. That's crazy. It is. My wife must be nuts to marry anyway, me for 13 get, years. Get, get back yeah, to okay, the story. Okay, back to the point. Okay, okay. Yeah, back to the story, yeah. which is a total side point. Yeah. Anyway, um, 13 years ago, 14 years ago, whatever it was, I can't remember exactly, the Walmart mm-hmm. near my house, mm-hmm. somebody got trampled to death on Black Friday when they opened the what? doors. Yes, someone got trampled to death over a flat screen TV. 
So I'm, <gasps> I'm not sure the world should thank us for Black Friday. I think the world maybe should curse us for Black Friday. Anyway, that's America, baby. That's horrible. Yes. Um, okay. By the way, you do make a good point in all seriousness. Mm. PLAs are – about the, the dates of the study. Um, PLAs are pretty volatile, and the numbers can spike closer to Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever holiday you celebrate in December, towards the end of December. Okay, so yes, that is a limitation of the data I am about to present. However, however, I picked November 1st because it's the first of the month and because it was relatively stable at that moment. But yes, again, PLA spike all of the time. They are generally one of the more volatile features on the CERP. Um, mm -hmm. So focus on the general trend here. That said, that said, I did check if there were crazy spikes that directly preceded or followed dates that I used or that were, that were reflective on the date that I used. So in some cases, I adjusted, right? If November 30th was a crazy spike that didn't reflect the average normal, I used December 1st instead because I'm not okay. a moron. As we despite, already reached the conclusion that you are a moron. So You yeah. reached that conclusion. I'm still getting there. <laughs> I'm behind the curve on this one. Because yes. you're a moron. Denial is not just a river in Egypt. Oh, wow. That, oh. Was, that was harsh. Can we just get to the data? Right, you're killing my thunder and sucking the joy out of my life right now. That is literally my job description. This is what it says. You go to LinkedIn and disappear Carabell. Joy killer, stealer of Morty's thunder. Right. They pay you, you for this at Rank my... Ranger, which I find to be a little <laughs> bit sadistic, but okay. Anyway. 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 Okay, data increase or decrease time, although I kind of gave it away, data increase time. Um, here's what mm -hmm. I found on the metric being looked at is the percentage of SERPs that contain at least one PLA on page okay. one, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's run through it country by country, okay? From November 1st mm -hmm. through November 30th, US, a 22% increase. South Africa, a 24% increase. The UK, a 7.89% increase. I don't know why I'm using that, the, like, the specific numbers for the UK, but I didn't round there, but I did. Uh, Canada, 9% increase. France, close to a 4% increase. Germany, 5.26% uh, increase. Australia, close to a 20% increase. And Spain, a 15% increase. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay, that meaning there is a, let's say Spain, right? 15% increase in the percentage of, um, of, of SERPs that contain at least one PLA on page one. Now, here's what's fickle about this data. Check out 2018. Let's run through the increases going back to 2018, November 1st, 2018, to November 30th, 2018. And the increases are U.S. Okay, remember, U.S. was a 23% increase in 2019, right? 0.59% right? increase. South Africa, 0.79% wow. increase. UK was a big increase, 13% increase. Canada, 24% increase. So Canada was on the lower side this year. Um, France, negative 32%, meaning there was a 32% loss. Germany, 23% loss. Australia, 3% loss. Spain, 3.7% increase. Meaning in 2018, many, many markets saw fewer PLAs during the start of the holidays shopping season, which is insane. I don't understand it. Okay. Right. Yet weird. And to quote Billy Definitely. Joel, don't ask me why. I I don't know that reference. I don't, I just. Billy Joel, you don't know Billy Joel. You are not from New York, that's for sure. If you know who Billy Joel is, but okay. Wow. Billy Joel, first album I ever bought ever was 1993's "River of Dreams" by Billy Joel. I don't care. I know you don't, we don't care. care. I'm talking to the audience. I'm not talking to you. <laughs> okay. Get over yourself. I'm not always mm -hmm. talking to you. Okay. <laughs> now here, now here, I'm going to get it after the show. Um, now here's where it gets super crazy. Let's look at the average number of PLAs on page one in 2019. Meaning, okay, we looked at the percentage of page one SERPs that now contain a PLA during the holiday season versus before the holiday season. But how many on average are showing up on the page? Is there just one PLA? Is there 20 PLAs? So... Um, on average, right, 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 sorry, let's look at the increases rather. Okay, in the U.S., in the number of PLAs being shown on page one, there is a 26% increase. South Africa, a 19% increase. The U.K., 20% increase. Canada, there was no increase. It was totally marginal. I wrote zero. Uh, France, 38% increase. Germany, 36% increase. Australia, 22% increase. And Spain, 37% increase. So Canada's probably, I would take that data as an outlier, and i probably have to reanalyze it. Um, okay. 
Okay, so oh, no, oh, now you're gonna compare it to the 2018 data, aren't you? You are so smart. Did anyone ever tell you that you're smart? Because you are <laughs> very smart. I know. <laughs> wow. I'm just gonna sit here and 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 revel in the fact of how smart you are. <laughs> you should, okay. but we don't have time. So. <laughs> okay. Get, get 2018, on with it. 2018. The, again, we're looking at the average number of PLAs on the page, page one before the holiday season and at the very start of the holiday season, shopping season, that is. Okay, um, U.S. Your U.S. had a 25% increase in 2019, just a 14% increase in 2018. U.K. saw a 4% decrease. U.K. U. Sorry, um, South Africa saw a 4% decrease. The U.K. saw a 9% increase. Canada saw a 12% increase. France saw an 18% decrease. Germany saw a 3% increase. Australia saw basically no increase or no decrease. It was marginally up. And Spain saw an 11% increase. Okay, So again, we're talking in 2019, we're talking numbers like 25% increase, 20% increase, 38% increase, 36% increase. Way more PLAs, the number of actual PLA units being shown on the SERP in holiday season 2019 versus holiday season 2018. In other words, way more shopping going on with Google Shopping in 2019 than 2018. It's really bizarre, really interesting. I guess you can do with this whatever you want to do with this data. It's a free world in most places, I guess. <laughs> but it, if you want to ask me, like, what's one takeaway from this morning? Well, it really helps you understand how competitive the PLA market is this time of year relative to the past and how competitive the SERP is because I use PLAs all the time, actually. I never buy anything through a PLA, but I'm searching for, I don't know, like a new couch. And, hey, there's a bunch of PLAs there. I'll look at it when I'm doing the research phase or if I'm not going directly to Amazon because usually I just go directly. Like, things like buying a shirt, I just go directly to Amazon. Bigger purchases when I'm researching, like a new couch, so the PLAs show up and I look at those and sometimes I click on those. So more PLAs might mean less clicks to your website because of more PLAs being on the page. So if you see your traffic is down, maybe check to see if PLAs are now showing on that page for that keyword. That might be why your traffic is down. Great. Happy? Done? Should we move on? Yes, please. Okay. 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 Awkward silence. It's like a first <laughs> date. Awkward silence. <laughs> right? <laughs> first date, like awkward silence. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, let me drive you home. And <laughs> <laughs> well, with more PLAs on the page this season, that changes discoverability and the discoverability landscape doesn't it? Well, this would be a great time for Garrett Merguth to come and join us to discuss just that. Pivot of the freaking year, cut one. Welcome to another In Search SEO podcast interview session. Today we have with us a prolific industry speaker, a marketing land author, and the CEO of Directive Consulting. He is Garrett Merguth. Welcome. How are you? Did I get the name wrong? No, that's perfect. Wow, look at that. I practice. Yeah, no, thank you, Mordecai. <laughs> oh, thank you, man. you got uh, it. That's great. Um, so, hey, before we get started, just a really quick Garrett fun fact that might surprise some people. Ooh. Um, Nothing too scandalous. Kind of, no, it's not scandalous. It's kind okay. of sad. I uh, <laughs> tore my Achilles uh, 10 weeks ago, and then I retore it last week. So, How? I, uh, yeah, no, not fun, but little known fact. Little known fact, tore my Achilles twice. How did you manage that? Months. Or do first I not want to know? Playing, well, first time I was playing soccer, just okay. um, non-contact. I played in college. Uh, it's kind of you know my sport. I, you know, oh, I, nice. I love, I love being an athlete, and you know, now I'm trying to pick up golf. Not currently, but before the Achilles injury. <laughs> and then, um, then the last one was in the shower, and the water went from like normal to freakishly hot. And then I stepped out and it re ruptured. Holy so mackerel. Kind of a freak accident. That's yeah, crazy. No, you know, that's, that's how life is. You can't really forecast it. So, you know, that's an interesting known fact, but excited to be here chatting with you today. Wow. Okay. Well, there's no standing involved or running involved in this. It's just your mouth. So <laughs> yeah. I think I think we'll be okay. No, you're all good, man. I'm going to go speak <laughs> at a conference tomorrow on one leg. So nice. I, I, it doesn't really stop me. Okay. Good for you. All right. So, we're going to talk about discoverability, and I just want to get everybody caught up on the same page in case you're not familiar with that term. So when we say being discoverable or discoverability, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, 
for me, discoverability is the whole reason why you exist in your, you know, the software and, 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 and what you're offering and then why I exist as a service provider. The, the whole, the whole point, right, of why search marketing exists is that people want to be found or discovered when their ideal customer persona or their target market is searching for the product or service that they sell. That, that's the whole kick and kaboo, the whole reason we exist. And unfortunately, for whatever godforsaken reason, that turned into, hey, how do I make my website rank for keywords? Right. It, and it kind of, I don't want to say like bastardized, but like changed the whole entire purpose of why we do our jobs. And it, 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 we got away from the fundamentals, the, the, it, the foundation of what search marketing is. And what I'm trying to do is bring marketers back to it in a way that it is realistic of the environment uh, of which, you know, a SERP landscape, a SERP means search engine results page, and it helps people just think practically about how can they be discoverable. Because that was the whole point, right, of why they're calling us, they're buying our software, they're paying us for services, is so that they can be discovered. It, and for some reason, that became getting backlinks, ranking my website, and keywords, which really is just a small portion of a bigger picture. So you must be very happy with, with machine learning and the fact that that makes, that makes SEO a little bit more holistic than it was a couple of years ago. I mean, I, I'm excited just that I think the average marketer is becoming more educated. I think it makes it a lot more difficult to run a, to run a services firm or even a software company in the space because you can no longer smell, sell snake oil. I mean, people have real experience in SEO or PPC or content these days. Um, they've worked with multiple agencies. They have real expectations. They need real results. And it's frankly quite difficult uh, to generate those real results because the landscape's so competitive. And I think that's another part, you know, people seem to forget is you, it's a competition. There's only 10 spots. And, and it's not like the current 10 are not being placed. In other words, you have to displace someone to theoretically take market share or identify opportunities that already exist and position yourself on those opportunities. And, and so it, that, that theory of just simplifying everything, like, so theoretically, right, you have two options if you want to be discoverable. You can try, like, organically. You can show up on a paid list or review site that already ranks. Uh, if you're local, that's Yelp. If you're in services, that's Clutch. If you're in software, that's G2 Crowd. That's Captera. That's software advice. These are all places where you can essentially pay to play or get reviews and show up. So that's one option to be discoverable. Or the other option is get your own website to show up. Now, theoretically, that's much more difficult because if you're not currently there, you have to displace someone. Well, if a third-party review site's already there, you can simply position yourself on there. And that usually is free or, or like free in the sense of like you, you can accomplish it with money. It's not free – financially, but it's free to secure uh, and you don't have to displace someone. And so when you start to think about things in game theory and just simplistically, it, it starts to make a lot more sense of how you can win. That's interesting. Uh, you mentioned that there, there's 10 organic results on the page. You're competing with those 10 results. I mean, I would argue that there's less results or even when there are 10 results, there are other features on the page that are also distracting the user's attention. How do you feel that discoverability works out in, a, in an era where there's so many SERP features for getting the organic results for a minute? Well, I mean, discoverability just comes down to are you on the SERP features or not? And if you're not, then we might want to work on being discoverable depending on the purchase intent or the stage of someone in that funnel. And so if we just deem that there's going to be um, some type of either brand value or direct response value that could turn into an opportunity to deal or revenue, then we have to ask ourselves, is it worth the time, resources, and attention that we would have to take away from other activities to go after that SERP feature? Um, you know, and it's just a constant analysis that way and world-class consultants know how to prioritize. And so if you're able to prioritize your efforts by looking at all available options and selecting the right ones on a consistent basis, then you're going to drive results. Um, um, that makes a lot of sense, but I'm wondering how that would work and say, let's say you're selling a product, right? It's in a very competitive vertical and, and Google is showing all sorts of product carousels on that page. I mean, how are you supposed to be discoverable when 
it's really just a matter of getting into those carousels or not getting into those carousels. And even when you are on those carousels, it's hard for you. It's hard for the user to see your brand. It's hard for you to be recognizable. They see the product, but you're really within. You're really stuck within a Google property at that point. Yeah, I would. I mean, I kind of disagree. First off, like going left to right has poor click through rates. So like G2 used to operate on a left to right model uh, with their product listings within their website. Now they've operate vertically on a more of a list model because you can generate more statistically significant click through rates top to bottom and left to right. And then those SERP features are usually just indicative of other results from that rest of that page. So they're just pulling from other resources a lot of times within the top 10 for that term. Mm -hmm. But that that to me is a little less valuable, right? Because we know that the number one organic result is going to have around a 30% click-through rate, give or take, okay? Right. And so you have to ask yourself, you know, it's no longer about being in the top 10. It's really more about being in the top five if you want statistical significance with volume from any given term. And then obviously the volume of that term is indicative of how much traffic you get. You know, I would so argue it's about being above the fold. And being in the top, it, it, you could be, there could be three results above the top fold. There, there are cases where there's one result above the top fold, in the top fold. If you're number two, I guarantee yeah. you're not getting a lot of traffic. Well, you're going to get statistically less, right, than number one. Yeah. Um, and so the, the goal, right, is to say, okay, can I be discoverable in as many places as possible for terms that I know generate ROI, not can I show up for more terms? See, a lot of times when we think about things, when we think about scale and we try to grow somewhat organically, we always try to think a lot of times in more terms. How do we show up? For more keywords. Uh, what I've found is that usually leads to diminishing marginal returns in the short term compared to thinking about how can I show up more often for the right terms. See, that's the concept of discoverability. It's about taking market share when you're already driving ROI. So that's about not only showing up on Captera, but also G2 and software advice and all these other essentially listings where possible on terms that are revenue, showing up with a search ad showing up with your own website, showing up in a SERP feature. It's about taking as much market share as possible for terms that you know are driving revenue based on your search term report and your Google Ads account or based on any type of attribution you have. So the goal isn't not always to show up for more keywords, especially as a consultant, because you need to come in right and drive results usually in a short amount of time where you have high statistical probability so that you can build trust. And so a lot of times it's about going deeper for the right term than trying to show up for more terms. I very much agree with that. I mean, on so many levels, algorithmically, I think Google has a preference for when you focus in on one particular area versus being stretched too thin, trying to target, you know, high search volume keywords. Um, you brought up review sites, like, you know, G2 Crowd, that sort of thing. And I'm wondering, so Google has, an, an, I've seen at least, Google has um, an increased preference for review sites. Like, for example, you know, three, four years ago, if you did a query for buy car insurance, so the only results you would get were, you know, nationwide, all state, guy call the insurance companies. But as RankBrain developed and Google's got a little bit more smarter about how it does things, it's realized that when in commerce, um, in, in commerce queries for the commerce intent, there is an informational aspect to it, an informational you know, subtopic to it that if you're going to buy insurance, you need to learn how to buy insurance or what insurance to buy or whatever it is. Uh, and these review sites start ranking for all these queries. I've done a study on this where I show that for software, uh, particular software queries, you're talking that 70% of the servers occupy with review sites, not sites you can buy that software you're looking for, which is an astonishing rate. How do you control the narrative on a review site? I mean, they can review you and place you in the top spot and you're visible, or they can you can be number 400 within the uh, the product listing. Well, um, so each one operates on different models. Um, I've been you know evangelizing the value of review sites for the last three years. Um, you know, we work with a lot of the largest brands in the world, and, and what we found is we help them build closed loop analytics, and they actually, a lot of times, have a 230% lower cost per opportunity from third party review sites for the same keywords that you're running Google Ads on. So, compared to Google Ads, you can have an exponentially lower cost per opportunity. Now, there's a couple reasons for this. One of them I call the Yelp and the Amazon effect. So, essentially, we've been programmed that if we're going to buy a $5 breakfast burrito, we're going to go look at reviews and find the re restaurant with the best breakfast burrito. Simultaneously, consumers, if they're going to do research on $5 breakfast burritos, they're sure as heck going to do research on $250,000 software. Right? Google knows this. So when you modify software queries with things like top best of reviews and you're indicative of purchase intent, like if you search top ERP software, all the results on that page are actually review sites. So there's not even one organic listing. That's not because Microsoft Dynamics or Oracle doesn't have a marketing department or a strong domain authority or a great page targeting that term. Is because Google's saying that our users 
are looking through for what they are deeming peer reviews and trusted resources. Now to answer your question there, Captera runs on a CPC model, G2 runs on a SAS model, Software Advice runs on a CPL model, and they're all somewhat different in that regard. And then others like Clutch run on what's called like a retainer model where you play a flat monthly rate. All of these are different. You need to understand them, right? And now Captera and Software Advice are both owned by Gartner. This is important because if you're in software, that means you only have to get a review in one place and shared across both platforms, which makes it a lot easier to instead of having to ask customers to leave reviews on multiple platforms, let's leave it on one. So there are some economies of scale. They also own GetApp, uh, which makes that easier. But no, there are, you know, across our SaaS portfolio, I think I've worked with over 300 SaaS brands in the last two years. Um, we are seeing uh, world-class results with publicly traded and private companies uh, from spending uh, on these third-party review sites. That's really interesting. I'm, I'm wondering, the first thought that, that pops in my head when I hear that is, how much, how, to what extent are these sites being played with, with the companies buying reviews? Like I could just buy 100 reviews and be number one in Captera. Um, it, it, it's a little difficult. So you can't just buy reviews necessarily. I mean, you can, but you can't. So um, some of them require LinkedIn verification. Some of them, like if you just want your employees to leave a review, they're going to have to put like where they work and then it's going to get flagged. Um, if people start to notice, like it's just like Yelp reviews. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're sending out like direct links, sometimes it'll get flagged. If they're coming from similar IP addresses, it'll get flagged. If it's coming from certain places or areas or anything like that, it'll get flagged. Uh, they do a decent job. Uh, it's not as, I, I don't think it's as uh, kind of bad as Amazon is right now in that sense, but they also do help you. So like if you want to, you can upload a customer list to these places and then they'll run a review campaign for you, like leveraging five to $10 Amazon gift cards and things like that. So. Uh, you know, they, they, they are actually pretty helpful in getting you the reviews. And I don't think there's that much review uh, fraud compared to other channels. Now, obviously, it goes on in every space. But, you know, for the most part, you know, these, these companies do have real customers that are leaving real reviews for the most part. Well, that's good to hear. Um, speaking of Amazon, which you just brought up, um, to what extent, I, and I always wonder about this with the yes SEO industry, we get very, very narrow-minded. Um, like we, get, we get focused on links and we get focused on keywords and we don't think about topics. We don't think about um, how our site is viewed by Google overall, that sort of thing. To what extent are we too focused on search and not focused enough on things like Amazon as a platform independent of search? I mean, it really just goes back to, once again, discoverability, right? Like if your ideal persona, your ideal customer is searching for the product you sell and Amazon is taking up a significant part of that buyer journey with SERP, you know, features, and you're not on that platform, you have to ask yourself, you know, do I have a way of acquiring customers at a lower customer acquisition cost than paying the Amazon fee? And if you do, then I think it makes logical sense. But if you can create economies of scale by, by still paying the Amazon fee and then increase market share, and then what in one way or another build brand value or get them off from that channel to another, uh, you know, that's great. I think at the end of the day, though, if you're not on Amazon in a product sense, it, it, it can be difficult as most people who are going for consumer products are actually a lot of times going directly to Amazon and they're searching from Amazon, not even from Google. Uh, like when I watch my wife or other, you know, people in my family search for products and I'll, you know, I'll just watch, they don't go to Google and then search for something and then go find it, you know, and then, oh, look, there's Amazon. They just go directly to Amazon and search for it. I mean, I do that myself. And so, you know, I think there is some power uh, to be on that marketplace. You just have to look at your margins and, and ask yourself if it makes sense financially. Because, you know, you can get all the sales in the world, but if you don't have the right margin, uh, it just, it, it, it doesn't matter. This is really interesting. Uh, and, and the same thing, by the way, I never go to Google, but apparently people do go to Google because Google is investing tons of money into their shopping products. So I guess mm -hmm. people are using it. I just don't know who. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you, so we, we we're talking about Amazon, we're talking about SEO and that sort of thing. But part of me feels like um, you know, you're, you're going to have your major your major players in any given market, and it's going to be hard to break in for certain people to to break into the SERP, particularly into the to above the fold or into a SERP feature like a feature snippet. And I'm wondering to what extent it makes sense to sort of branch out and sort of think of other ways to become visible, whether it be buying banner ads, whether it be AdSense, whatever it is, to be visible so that. The user almost avoids search in a sense and just goes straight to you or does a navigational search to find you. Yeah, I mean, there's a ton of wisdom there. Uh, what I'm preaching on and speaking on and what my, you know, my deck actually for next year is all about is 
how to build your brand. Because if you look, you know, in an attribution model or anything like that, almost always your best cost per acquisition is from your direct traffic. Yet most of us aren't doing anything to build branded traffic because we don't see immediate ROI. And we've been tricked into this belief that only things that are valuable are trackable and drive X amount of ROI. And, and that's the only way to think is, oh, well, what's the ROI? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, well, well what's the ROI? And, and then we go about our day buying backpacks, swag, cold brew, kombucha, and the rest of it when we could have just gone on LinkedIn, done a text ad, done CPC bidding instead of CPM, and then generated, like I was just able to generate over 2 million impressions on my exact persona for $2,000. That to me is hyper valuable. All those people are now getting tagged and getting remarketed to. All those people I can run remarketing lists for search ads on at a lower CPA than my traditional search ads. Because right, here's the problem with a lot of things is if you can build your audience and then run remarketing lists for search ads, you intrinsically got the number one part of search marketing right, which is timing. In other words, you built your audience with your ideal persona, and then you positioned yourself to be discovered when the timing was right. If you can do those things on a consistent basis, I mean, you can be ungodly effective. I mean, since launching these campaigns, We've been having conversations with the largest brands in the world, and I can't directly attribute it to it because the tracking is just still not there yet uh, internally. But I can tell you right now, I wasn't having conversations with those people before, and I sure as heck would pay more than $2,000 to have conversations with them. And I'm able to generate millions of impressions on my exact buyer and persona, whether that's on in-market audiences on GDN, on Google's display network, or text ads using a CPC bidding because Google, I mean, because LinkedIn essentially, nobody clicks on text ads on LinkedIn, which is completely fine. And so what happens is because no one clicks on them, but you're doing a CPC bidding, Google sent, or LinkedIn, I apologize, accelerates your impressions at an insane amount because they're trying to generate you clicks. And so you actually get a far cheaper CPM than if you ran a CPM campaign on LinkedIn. And with that kind of uh, of insight and knowledge, we're driving millions of impressions at, at, at a ridiculously low rate from like the best targeting in the world. That's really interesting. So to what extent do you, if, if you could advertise on NASCAR, right? And you have like Cheerios on the front hood of a NASCAR and gain that visibility. Is that something you would do? Are you into your brand being visible and not, not necessarily it resulting in clicks, not necessarily in it resulting in traffic, but simply brand awareness? Oh yeah. I mean, I don't think I would do NASCAR. I'm just using that like, example, but yeah, I'm going to do NASCAR. Like, to give you a, a realistic example of some things like I, I, I love uh, podcast ads, absolutely love podcast ads. We've closed almost half a million dollars this year from podcast ads to give you context. Mm. I love freeway sponsored by ads. So going and uh, sponsoring Adopt a Highway in San Francisco, instead of paying $15,000 a day for the billboard, pay $500 for the month for the Adopt a Highway nice. sign right below it. Uh, I love uh, airport ads in areas that have your ideal persona, uh, whether, so for me, a lot of it's SAS. So whether that's Denver, San Francisco, Provo, Portland, Seattle, um, LAX, whatever that, Santa Monica, whatever that is. Um, but no, I, I I'm a, a entirely a fan of brand. I mean, there's nothing better you can do than to build people who actually have a desire to work with you so that when they have timing, and even if they don't have brand recall, in the sense that they don't just go directly to you, but they still search, I want them to have heard of me before when they find me. Right. And if you search for what I offer and you have purchase intent, you will discover my brand. The question is, is will you have an affinity to use me at that moment over someone else? Will I be one of the three tabs that you have open when you schedule a quote? And if I am, I, I know I can win 30% of the time. And, and so that's my goal. That's one of my qualms about the new mobile SERP where you have the Favicon showing up. That if I see if I see a brand's logo that I know versus a brand's logo that I don't know, I don't care if the the, the one that I don't know is number one and the one that I do know is number ten, I'm gonna click on the logo that I know. Correct. And that that right there, right, allows you to overcome some of the SERP realities by building brand affinity and creates, you know, a moat around incumbents in your marketplace. Right. I'm wondering, okay, 
off the top of your head, if you could pick two two digital platforms, two digital areas where you can shoot for um, advertising to increase um, visibility, your brand awareness, where would you go? I mean, obviously, obviously it depends LinkedIn. on the vertical. Okay, LinkedIn and LinkedIn. LinkedIn and LinkedIn. Why? Nobody had. Well, if you're in B two B, nobody has the targeting they have. Okay, right. so like right. Facebook used to import audiences from Axiom and other players in the space, and you could do pretty good targeting there. They've removed that. It, it it's very very difficult to do it. Now, Google has rolled out some new innovative products to, to certain, you know, premium advertisers where you can do B2B type targeting. It's a joke. Okay. We have full, like we have full cycle attribution and we did this where we're targeting. Okay. These uh, technology vertical with 250 employees plus freelancers directly from that targeting and filling out our ads. It's a joke. Um, in market audiences, we're building exact um, audience lists in LinkedIn from people who come from our in-market audiences and display and our ability to match those pixels to active profiles on LinkedIn is at around 3%. In other words, the actual valuable traffic you're able to generate even from in-market audiences is marginal at best compared to LinkedIn. Fascinating. All right. So where, where do, where do you rank Google ads on the SERP? Uh, number two, well, uh, number one is third-party review sites. Number two is Google Ads. Interesting. You say you put review sites above Google Ads. I mean, I have data that shows a 230% higher cost per oppor- like lower cost per opportunity and from third-party review sites than Google Ads over two years data across 300 brands. Well, that nicely sums that up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, but, but, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, can't really argue with that. So before I have a little fun little bit that I do at the end of our interviews, but um, before that, I just want to ask you a very general question. So if you're, if you're a brand thinking about trying to be more visible, more discoverable, just what are some general tips? What do you recommend brands doing, small brands in particular? Yeah, take the amount of money you're willing to lose. I call this a frappuccino a day. Take whatever that money is for you, okay? CEOs spend money on random stuff. Marketing spends money on random stuff. HR spends money on random stuff. Admin spends money on random stuff. Okay. Go look at all the money that you're like, I don't know why the hell we're spending on that. Okay. Right. Or don't do that. Just be even kind of lazy, which is fine. I'm lazy too. And just say, okay, I don't mind losing 10 bucks a day. Sure. Make that your new brand budget. Seriously. Go make that your new brand budget and then go have some fun And, and think about clarity. Okay. A lot of us, have really bad taglines. We love bad taglines. Like, uh, imagine like SEO software and then you're like SEO software and your tagline is changing the way SEOs do business. You don't say you're a software and you don't know what you do. And remember, (laughs) when you do a branded ad, what you want to think about is not changing human behavior, but understanding it and leveraging it. In other words, if you run a branded ad, what you're going to know no matter what, your click-through rate's crap. Nobody clicks on it on display ads. Right. So right. build ads that work without the click. So what I believe is that you always want to say what you do and who you do it for in any branding campaign because you need to get that across without anyone ever clicking because your landing page doesn't matter if 98% of the people don't click. And so you have to ask yourself is was I enabled to essentially derive awareness for what I do and who I do it for? So mine is – Search marketing agency for enterprise brands. The search marketing agency for enterprise brands. Really, really simple, directly. And I will show that ad till I die to as many people as possible because I know that when that person searches and they search SEO agency, they're going to find me in the top five and they're going to find me on all the review sites. They search PPC agency, they're going to find me on the top maybe five, six. I don't know. It depends on their location sometimes. And they're going to see me on review sites. If they go in their inbox. They're going to get emails from my sales development team. They go to a conference. They're going to see me sponsoring. If they go on to a podcast, they're going to hear us talk. But no matter what, they're going to have brand affinity and awareness for us. So when the time comes, when they're ready to purchase, and I've found it's about one to two times a year, whether they're on a six or 12 month contract with another agency and they reevaluate their options, I'm going to be one of the three people to talk. And at that point, I can, you know, drive revenue. So it, I've said this a million times on this podcast, it all comes down to brand identity. Yeah, just I, I want to be discoverable 
And when I'm discovered, I want them to have some type of affinity or awareness for me already. And if I do those two things, I can do exceptionally well. And I'm talking with a thousand dollars a month, $500 a month. You can build millions of impressions for your brand because so few people are doing it that the inventory is that cheap. Awesome. Okay. So, so with that, um, I have a little bit that I do. If you listen to this show, you know what it is. It's called Optimize It or Disavow. It's where I give you two really good options or two really um, bad options, and you're stuck choosing one over the other one. It's like a zero-sum game. Cool. Yeah. So this is the Garrett Merguth version of Optimize It or Disavow It. So your question is, if you had to do one over the other one, uh, in order to build discoverability, and they're two really bad options, and th that's it. It's what it, it is what it is. Um, would you pay a review site to feature your product or service more prominently, or would you just buy a ton of links so that you rank better on the SERP, allegedly? I don't buy links, so I would just get the I would do the review site. You pay for the review site, okay? Yeah, I don't. I don't do links. Like I don't pay for links to be honest. So. Do you link build I, at all, uh, or do you not care? Like, links don't matter. Yeah, man, I'm on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, man, I do a ton of link building. I do, but I call just it PR. Refuse to pay for because links. I just don't. I don't buy them. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm against I, buying links. Also, yeah. I'm just curious why you're against buying links. Not that I'm against you. I'm totally with yeah. You. No, I. I mean, well, here's the thing. So if you go back five years. I take Audience Bloom, Fat Joe, and the rest of them, and, and I bought links. And what I found is because I wanted to make sure I wasn't leaving a viable option for my clients off the table. And so what I found is that these sites, and this should be no surprise to anybody, are running on link networks. Okay, These are sites that when you go get your link report from Fat Joe or Audience Bloom or the rest of them, there's a million of them every day, and you actually search for the site that you're on, the domain authority is 60 or 30 or whatever you paid for. It's not that I don't know the game, but you go search for those sites that are linking to you. Theoretically, you won't even find them in the surf a lot of times. Yeah. That's because they are literally due to the latest algorithms just being ignored. Now, the, the, the crazy part is that on a cost of goods sold basis for a lot of SEO agencies, this is accounting for 15 to 30 percent of their total budget and 60 percent oftentimes of the total available resources to an account for something that will not now create a manual action like it used to, but instead literally create nothing. And so a lot, a lot, a lot of what people are paying for if they're hiring an SEO agency for less than 6K a month is literally for that agency to be buying links. And any agency that guarantees you links is buying links because you can't guarantee X amount of links unless you're buying links. Right, it exactly. And so if you are doing that, what's happening is those links are literally not driving results. I mean, I did this for a three month period to experiment on it, spent probably $50,000 buying links to give you context. I don't, I don't like this kind of do things. I usually do them all the way. And, and I saw no statistical increase across any site that despite all their promises and, and BS market. So no, I, I just don't believe that it works. And I think it's a improper allocation of fun and it's a misuse of resources that creates a, you know, a misportrayal of what actually works on search engine. Amen. Amen, brother. I appreciate that. I like hearing that. Don't hear that often enough. All right, Garrett, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time. It's been great. And uh, good luck oh, to your Achilles, man. Oh, thanks. No, glad, glad to be here. And uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks. And we are back to your regularly scheduled in search SEO podcast discoverability it's good yeah you should focus on it um let's move along we're, we're, we're running a little long no we're not actually but let's move along let's move along let's keep us let's keep it's a quote crusty the crown crusty the clown i got it out not crusty the crown crusty crust i can't speak today crusty the clown from the simpsons let's keep this train wreck moving let's keep this uh -huh. show moving but i'm calling it a train wreck Let's just do the news. Okay. Let's let's just do, let's the, news. Just do the news. By the way, okay? every every family yeah. event, my uncle goes, let's just keep this train wreck moving. Anyway. <laughs> Sapir, a lot of big news this week. Actually, a lot of big <gasps> news this week. Um, Sapir, can you be so kind? Would you be so kind mm -hmm. as to hit it with the news? Google 
Google has made BERT international. Danny Sullivan announced that BERT is being applied to languages other than English, 70 languages to be exact. And that's and, I, and I've seen some folks saying, okay, well, maybe feature snippets are going to be shown now in, in our language in our country because of this. I don't think I don't think so. There's Bert helps Google refine and understand the query. Google could have translated, you know, um, in the in, or done or shown feature snippets in whatever language for a very long time if it wanted to. I don't think this could actually correlates to feature snippets entering um, markets where they haven't been shown in the native language. Mm -hmm. Yes, very interesting. Okay. Google has launched a new publishing center. The new center makes it easier for publishers to manage multiple publications. So that's great. And there's more, there's big, I'm sure you have this in your list. There's big, big, big news publisher um, news on the SERP information news coming at you in a minute. Mm -hmm. I, I, just, just go ahead. Just go ahead. <laughs> okay. It appears Google is getting ready to release new guidelines on paginated content, being that rel equals next and rel equals priv is no longer supported. And that was brought to you by friend of the show and great around, uh, great all around SEO and great all around person, Egal Stoltmer, who saw John Mueller hint at new guidelines at a webmasters conference, whatever you call those things. Mm -hmm. Yep. Moving on. Within image search, Google is now letting you know if the product reflected by the image is in stock on the site. Right. So let's say you see, I don't know, you search for new pants, new pants, new pants, new pants, <laughs> and right. Amazon or I don't know, Walmart, let's say Walmart, um, better, probably a better example, uh, shows up with a pair of pants. And mm -hmm. you can click on the image and, you know, we zoom it in and make a bigger image, whatever you want to call it. And you'll now see these pants are out of stock at Walmart because Walmart has no more pants. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. That's Morgan. good, no, but it's well, good. It's important. It's important to make sure you keep your stuff in stock because now people can see the images. Right. Thank you, Morgan. You're welcome. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, big news for the news carousel on the Google SERP. Google is now showing multiple new carousels for many queries, with each carousel reflecting different topics related to the story. Right. So this was the uh, – saving the best for last. This was a big news item I was referring to. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, you'll say you do, I don't know, like NASA news. That was the example good thing Google gave. You'll see different carousels, you know, like NASA going to the moon, NASA going to Mars, NASA going to lunch. With all different <laughs> stories, I, I can't think of anything. All different stories <laughs> related to NASA going to the moon, NASA going to Mars, and NASA going to lunch. Um, but one of the interesting things about this, though, is that Google said that part of this carousel process is is powered or sponsored by not sponsored by powered by by Bert. That Bert knows where one story ends and where the next story begins, looking at the related articles. I find that interesting. I'm not sure exactly how that works. I know, okay, um, BERT does do entity recognition, right? If you, when you token, when you, when you split up all the, the text on a page, it knows how to pick out the entities, which makes sense. So it, I can, I can understand how it would be able to see in one article versus the next, what entities are showing up. I don't understand the exact connection between BERT and seeing via the related articles that show up where one story ends and another news story topic subtopic begins so if you know let us know because i'm confused by this okay yep I'm, I'm i'm i am secure enough in my own seo knowledge to admit when i don't understand something <laughs> despite my tiny that's tiny good, study size right right <laughs> Now it's the part where you thank me for the news. Oh, yes. I'm and... sorry. Thank you so much, Sapir, for the news and for mocking me earlier. <laughs> You're welcome. You're yeah. a yes. um, This brings us then directly to the final segment of this fine episode of the In Search SEO podcast. Hit the music. Take it away because it's time for the fun SEO send-off question. Today's question is brought to you by Sapir. So if you don't like it, complain to her. Please, it's a great question. Do you want to share it then, maybe? <laughs> or you just want to, or again, just want to bask in your glory? Yes, it was a great, it's a great, glorious question. It is, it is. Okay, I'll share it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, if Google could be described as an iconic historical quote, which one would it be? Which quote you mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. Which quote? Okay. So. 
do you want to answer first? Or oh, that's polite I? of you to ask. No, no. Um, you can go first. <laughs> I like to have Who? the better answer come second. Oh, wow. <laughs> Not because I'm polite and nice. I'll let you go first. Uh -huh. Don't think okay, that. Okay, let's, let's see about that. Mm -hmm. So my answer is um, the following quote. To improve is to change. To be perfect is to change often. This quote was said by Winston, Winston Churchill. Oh, that's I like Churchill as a historical figure. Like I'm big into World yeah. War II. I, I used to be a history teacher, and I used to teach a lot of World War II history. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a nice quote. It is a nice. Yeah, quote. that's nice. <laughs> I'm nothing wrong with yeah. it, really. <laughs> nothing, nothing great about it. No, it's, oh, it's a good quote. I won't, okay, I, won't okay. I won't take that away from you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's hear your quote. My quote oh, is, almighty. "Yeah, I'm selfish." Impatient yes, you are. <laughs> and yeah. a little insecure. I make yes, mistakes. I'm yeah. out of control and at <laughs> times hard to handle. But if you can't handle me at my worst, then you sure as hell don't deserve me at my best. Oh, that's famous. Norma Jean Mortensen said that. Better known as Ooh. Marilyn yeah. Monroe. Oh. Nice. But I think it describes Google. I'm selfish, impatient, a little insecure. I make mistakes. I'm out of control. Okay, I took that too far. I took you, it too uh, yeah. far. Because <laughs> then Google's not out of control. It's not selfish. Maybe it's a little insecure, and they do make mistakes. And if we can't handle them at their worst, though, then we sure as hell can't handle Google at its best. Right. Wow, My quote wins, was... hands down. My quote uh, wins. I, I don't think so. I, There's I'm no sorry. There's no way. There's no way. Your quote is just like it's a, okay. It's a nice quote and all. It's but, so okay. much more. I wasn't. I wasn't pithy. impressed. I'm sorry. Uh, you know what? You and the audience, you what? let us know whose quote was better. Mine from the great <laughs> Marilyn Monroe, or Sapir <laughs> quoting Churchill. Right. Very interesting it's figure, Churchill. Churchill. Mm-hmm. But slightly less cool than Marilyn Monroe. Anyway. <laughs> that will do it for this version of the In Search SEO Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to tune in next Tuesday for an all-new episode. It's been In Search because we're all in search of something. Of something. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye.